So, um, so thank you, everybody, and um, thank you to the previous pr presenters. Um, and I guess uh, to sort of pull this last session together as quickly as we can, but uh, make it relevant at the same time, um, I would mention that throughout the conference we've, um, we've heard from a variety of experts um, <clears throat> with regards to regulation, accountability, uh, profitability, and how these come together to strike the social balance. So in this final session, uh, we're here to focus on the social balance, the community's expectations, uh, and if these are not realistic or met, the resulting, the resulting outrage. The only outrage we'll have today if we go too long is that we're now standing between uh, our, this, this room is you know, sort of taking up space where people would like to get to the bar maybe, so we better keep moving. The, um, the questions that I would like to, like to pose uh, at, the, at the outset, uh, firstly to, uh, to Andrew Spencer, um, uh, and I guess this is about you know, do we see things differently. Um, Andrew, can, can you explain the alignment between a production challenge and a community issue or, or a concern? Um, and I can do it in A, B and C. Maybe if I give you all then you can ask me if you don't recall some of them. But what challenges have you faced in communicating uh, how close or how far this alignment, uh, the alignment is? And um, is it in the top five issues of a daily, on the daily basis of a pork producer? So, um Don, I note that there's probably a lot of differences with the pork industry as the live export industry, and they, they sort of came to me when Kelly was up giving his presentation, that a lot of the discussion around live exports, whether a community member supports it or doesn't support it, is relatively benign in terms of the effect on them. Whereas if they wanted to ban factory farming, for example, they know there are consequences in the availability of Australian bacon and a good pork chop. So there are differences in, in the various industries. But from our perspective, because we produce all of our pork here in Australia and 90% of it is consumed here in Australia, the consumer and the community are both important to us. And uh, we see their importance as our major focus. So we have to provide products to them that are produced in a way that they support and have attributes uh, that add value to, to, to that purchase. And we are quite prepared as an industry to move, to change our production practices if it results in a more valued product to our consumer or a more secure and sustainable industry to our community. That's in most cases. There are cases where you do get a clash between what the community or the consumer may want but what we believe is in the best interests of our animals. And that's where you can't compromise. And animal welfare is a science and science uh, Science gives us the information uh, to be able to optimise welfare. Consumers have a lot of perceptions about what good welfare is and they often mix it up with nature. Uh, so some of the things we do, they don't necessarily like, but we do it for the very best reasons that we find the best balance of welfare in there. Good a couple of good quick examples. We took a decision six years ago to voluntarily stop the use of sow stalls. That sounds like a great idea. It actually is backed up by millions of dollars worth of research and development that enabled us to do that in a way that did not compromise the welfare of the sows in question. And so the industry could take that decision knowing it wasn't going to have a negative welfare impact. Before that time, we couldn't do that. We are still doing a lot of uh, research on another, uh, another tool we use in the industry called piglet protection pens or farrowing crates, which are also very tightly confining pens for our pigs and they help protect the piglets from being rolled over by their mother. So we've been doing a lot of research in the area of looking at alternatives to that very confined space and finding a better way to do it. And we cannot do that. We have not found a better way of uh, protecting piglets in particular but overall welfare than by using a farrowing crate. So yes, we can stop using sow stalls without compromising welfare but no, we can't stop using piglet protection pens without compromising welfare. And they're, they're the choices you have to make. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Andrew. I mean, David, um, did you have any response to that? Well, I just or think it sounded extremely least? sensible, very well explained, and um, really corresponds to the sort of perceptions I have with regard to um, management in the pig industry. Thanks. I'll, I'll move on, uh, Troy, a question for you. Yes. So, a question for yourself. Um, can you outline the key, issue, key issues of outrage 
uh, that you are facing as an industry and describe an example from your own experience uh, of successfully addressing uh, the outrage. Thanks, thanks, Don. I mean, I think we look at key issues of outrage and things that in the last couple of years that have, uh, that have brought the most outrage that have certainly been at, at the point of slaughter for, for larger animals. Um, and you know, the point of slaughter done properly or done poorly looks, uh, looks terrible. Certainly if it's done, done poorly it, it looks worse. But I mean, death, death is not nice in, in, uh, in, a, in any animal or, or in humans. And, and uh, you know, it's got to be done properly and we certainly support it being properly. But that, that's often the, the sort of the cause of, of most angst is around the point of slaughter for, for larger animals. And then also the confinement of animals that are being, being transported. Um, particularly if there's, uh, there's vision of animals that have you know, fallen over where there's manure or, or effluent. And sometimes those photos are taken out of context. They do look pretty, pretty terrible, but I think the, a lot of the outrage on those sort of pictures is, has been when there hasn't been context mm. put, put with that. And certainly animals shouldn't suffer in transport. I'm not, not trying to justify anything, but I think the most amount of outrage I've seen around some of that pictorial stuff is, is when there, there hasn't been context. Um, in terms of me and my experience, um, you know, I get, uh, you know, I've had a, quite a few attacks on, you know, from being involved in not just the live export industry but the production of food and, and farming um, from, from people all over the world. Um, you know, you, 2011 there was quite a few people in this room that received, you know, significant amounts of death threats and that's sort of on the, on the extreme end. And, uh, and hate mail, and then through today to the you know the, the social media attacks that, uh, that you get, and that that's again on the on the extreme end. But I try and engage with with people if I've uh, if I can. Um, the the I've sort of found that the people that won't show you their name or or uh, you know what I'd call the protect the professional activist that's just looking for a fight. Mm. Uh, they're looking for for something to attack or or looking to sort of justify or or help their cause in some other way are, are hard to engage with and they're not, they're not interested in the facts or, or, or sharing the, the pain with you. I mean, it, at times, you know, yes, there is facts with, with everything, but, but you know, if someone says, look, you know, what do you think about these photos? They're just absolutely terrible. Diving straight in and saying, no, but the facts are, mm. I've, I've certainly found when saying, yes, that is terrible. Um, that's not acceptable mm. and, uh, and share that. But then, however, these are the facts. Um, that that has been uh, has been interesting, but we do get people that are um, that will engage and and want to want to talk about what uh, you know what their view is on on live export or northern cattle production or you know anything to do in the in the food production space. And some of the the really interesting ones have been once you start engaging with people and explaining you know why we do what we do, what what are we trying to do, what's working, what's not working, and what does success look like. And what are we trying to do in the future? I find a considerable number of people actually engage. You know, a few of them then say, well, that sounds pretty good. Some say that's not, not so good. When you start drawing parallels, though, with, with some of the, the pretty extreme people who, who will really give it to you and say, well, you know, what about the fishing industry? You know, we're talking about a large, say, 600 kilo steer here that you don't like the po point of death. What about marlin fishing, or mm. or what about game fishing, or what about pig chasing? And and it really frustrates me mm. when I when people say to me that doesn't interest me, or I don't see a problem with that. I see a problem with with killing an animal, and mm. and I, I struggle at times when when people will sort of you know activists who or or people that are interested, not everyone's an activist, um, get to try and say no, that that's acceptable with this animal, but it's not acceptable with that animal, and. Mm. And that's a, that's a really challenge to go through sometimes when you when you're dealing with people that are yep. you know, anti what you're trying to do. <laughs> know it well, uh, Kelly. We've sort of touched on an area that you've just been talking to us about. Yep. Would you like to share some comments? I mean, certainly that is the you know getting your messages right. So when someone raises you know the the worst case scenarios with you, the terrible photos, 
the very first step is to validate that they're terrible photos and this sort of thing shouldn't happen because it sounds like you're at least understanding their point of view. You know, that's where you want to start with all this information. It's understanding that's where people are coming from, that's where they are, that's their anchor. Um, and if you're not doing that, they feel you're not listening and that's why the debate gets more heated. That's why you end up with the death threats because most people don't adopt that approach. Their gut feel is I need to convince you that this is unlikely one of the small you know, occasions that this happened rather than address that issue. Um, so, you know, it's how the debate becomes polarised. So if you want a debate that's less polarised, you know, validating people's concerns is a great place to start. Yeah. <laughs> um, Heather, the, um, uh, you know, with the understanding that uh, RSPCA has a policy of a, po and I'm, I'm moving to the live export trade specifically here, that uh, the RSPCA has a policy of opposing the trade, the, the trade continues, so what can we do? What can we do to work together, uh, industry, uh, RSPCA? So I suppose just to explain why the RSPCA opposes the live export trade, it's because our policy is that all animals should be slaughtered as close to the point of production as possible. So, you know, the ideal is animals are raised on a farm and killed on a farm and that they're not transported and handled multiple times. So it's not because we don't like you, but we think abattoirs are okay. It's just that we think animals should be slaughtered as close to the point of production as possible. For all those reasons, really, David was talking about in terms of their experiences. So in terms of um, what can we do to work together, knowing that we have an opposing view, the RSPCA also um, really, and, and we pride ourselves on uh, accepting that even if something we don't believe should be happening continues to happen. We want to make sure that the experience for animals is as good as it can possibly be. So we set aside, in me being here, we set aside the fact that I disagree with what your industry is doing, but what we want to do is make sure that the experience for animals is as good as it can possibly be. And so in terms of working together, you know, what we want to see in the first instance is a commitment to um, not only just talking about animal welfare, but it's doing animal welfare. It's a commitment to uh, um, actually putting into place Australian standards in overseas facilities and not fighting that. Um, and it's a commitment to doing things like uh, recognising that on board ship standards need to improve. Uh, the the uh, ASIL, the standards for on board ship, hasn't been reviewed substantially since 2011. The Farmer Review in 2011 said that there should be a comprehensive review of standards on board ship. Um, there, there was a, a, a document prepared and three years ago we actually went to ALIC and said we would like you um, and us uh, to go to the federal government, the new federal government at the time, and uh, see this review concluded and standards improved. Uh, we're three years down the track now and ALIC has not chosen to do that. So what we want to see in terms of working together is actually you wanting to work together. Um, there are things that uh, we do agree on. We do both agree that standards on board ships should improve. Mm -hmm. So let's do something about actually delivering it. I suppose the third example is um, you can't rely on PR spin. Um, so in Vietnam earlier this year, the industry came out um, with horror and shock as been, you know, that's what the crisis communication theory says that you need to do. You have to recognise that what you were seeing was unacceptable, and it absolutely was. Uh, it wasn't the first time, of course, that what we were seeing was unacceptable. Um, but then the industry made commitments to task forces and urgent action, and we're now in um, just about in November, and I haven't heard a single thing about what has happened in Vietnam since, uh, since April. So if there's, it's PR spin is not going to actually get you to a better place to actually address some of the things that Kelly's just talked about. It's actually um, talking, recognising that there's an issue, talking about what you need to do and, and engaging groups like the RSPCA to actually um, tell us what, what have you done, what have you fixed. Uh, we're not naive, we recognise how difficult these markets are to work in. But um, when there is an absence of information, we have to assume nothing is happening. Thanks, thanks, Heather. Um, <coughs> the and I guess this is a um, this is a, a question to all the panel. Um, the, the general public uh, and at times enabled by activists uh, are outraged, and and as a result, they demand significant changes. Uh, and some cases, you know, they they look for extreme responses. 
without consideration of the, of the consequences. I mean, would, would the panel agree with that or disagree with that? Um, and and what, would be, what would be your thoughts? Can I start? You can do that, Heather. Uh, um, I think you have to be, you know, you've got to do everything you possibly can to ensure there aren't, uh, there aren't situations uh, appearing and occurring time and time and time and time and time again um, that mean that people have to look over your, your shoulder. Uh, you know, it is about being transparent. It is about self-reporting. It is about, um, you know, recognising things are tough, but here's what we're doing to improve. Um, you have to put information out, as Kelly was just talking about. Information is your friend, and the more people, the more you can put out. Um, the, the less questions we will have because we certainly, as, as Australia's mainstream, most loved, most trusted animal welfare organisation and one of Australia's most loved, most trusted charities, um, people do listen to what we say and if we've got concerns, they have concerns too. So you don't want us to have concerns. Uh, Don, yes, maybe sir. I can add something. Um, I agree with Heather, but the way we see it had some parallels to what Kelly presented earlier. Outrage uh, there's sort of this bubbling outrage that's always there about issues in our industries and we call it the windowless room where it just circulates amongst a very small minority of people who self-justify and maintain a, a level of outrage that then escapes when there's an incident. And actually for us the most important thing to do is make sure that there's no incidents because of course the media get onto it and let's face it, so the incidents are the serious bit. And in most cases, not all, in most cases the, the outrage can be justified by the general public. That's what you've got to avoid. Because talking to the people in the windowless room is a waste of our time. Yeah. Uh, Kelly, you can say Yeah, something. I think your start of your question said, you know, did activists cause this outrage? I think that's a really mistaken view. If you think your activists are causing the outrage, you've, you know, you've got the thing completely around the wrong way. They're certainly telling people about it, but your responses are causing the outrage. Your responses to what they're raising with you is causing the outrage. That's what's causing the vortex, that you're not responding the right way. You're not, you're not following up when you say you'll do things. You're not, you're not um, showing that you do care about the issues. So Heather's right. The first part of it looks like spin. The second part isn't. Um, if you're only using the first part, you're making a mistake. I mean, I think if, if something's wrong with animal welfare, it's, it's, it's got to be fixed. And none of us want to, to see or have bad, bad practices in place. And, and if there is mistakes or if there is things intentionally done or, or there's uh, you know, a lack of compliance that needs to be dealt with, I think, and, and dealt with properly. Because when we do see outrage and, or do see issues and problems, I mean, none of us, none of us like it. it. But it's a responsibility of all of us to be involved in fixing it. I think stakeholder management is, is a challenge. I mean, we, we have a, you know, a legal responsibility to the regulator as, mm -hmm. as, uh, as managers of animals, whether it's production or processing or, or slaughter or live export, and that, that often takes first, first priority. And there's people who get really frustrated and will make a lot of noise and say, you should have told me first. Mm -hmm. And you're there with this wrestling going, but hang on a minute, you're a rights activist and this is a government regulator and I've got to, you know, so that, that can be challenging at times for, for some people, but stakeholder management, who needs to know, who doesn't need to know, when you're in the middle of I need to fix this problem is, is, is really resource challenging for, for everyone, um, but it's outside of that period of time yeah. that we need to do a better job of engaging with the stakeholders that have a legitimate or real interest in our, uh, in our industries. Mm -hmm. I might uh, throw to the audience for questions in the interest of time. Um, do, I, do I have questions to any particular panellist or on a particular subject that they've covered? Yeah, yeah David. David, just two seconds, I'll give you, an, I'll give you a mic. Yeah. Uh, David Jarvie, uh, in, in industry operative, and I'm a veterinarian. Um, the one of the things that I see that obviously there's always criticism from people that are looking in on the industry that, that the industry cannot regulate itself. And um, one of the things that I would like to see is that when regulation is required, we get regulation and we do get strong regulation. Um, I've been in the industry for 35 years 
and, and, and at times when there is ineffective regulation, I think that, that exacerbates the problems for the industry. So, I mean, um, I think it's very, very important not only there to, there to be effective regulation, but there needs to be seen to be effective regulation. And I think that that, that may be one of our problems at the moment. I, I'd like to hear the comments from Heather. Maybe Heather might like to start off the ball there. I mean, I think the, the, the biggest mistake the industry made was not requiring stunning in SCAS as a, as a mandatory requirement in every market. And that, in setting a benchmark for animal welfare in, in a regulatory system, um, and, and I'm sure if you apply your mind to it, you can overcome all the barriers that everybody always tells me about. Uh, certainly been able to be overcome in, in Vietnam. So I think it's actually about um, having regulation that meets community expectations, remembering that Australians um, think that you know, the way our animals are raised and killed is okay in, in the main. And so your, a lot of your problems would disappear overnight if you made a commitment to actually achieving that overseas. And then you're re you, you have a regulatory system that you actually overshoot every single day. Uh, you know, the best industries actually have regulation as the, the minimum safety net, but you all go way above it. I think this industry has um, a number of people are there for a short and fast buck, and they uh, have a significant impact on those of you that are there for the long term. A comment from Troy. Uh, a, a comment and probably a question to, to Heather. I think, you know, David, I've been on quite a few committees in my short period, nothing like your time, and it's been quite frustrating when we've had things like ASOR reviews that, uh, you know, industries actually wanted to get things done and the political climate hasn't been right or the, the political timing hasn't been right to get things through and, uh, and you know, getting good reform is something that, that all of us, I think, are quite, quite keen to get. There's the process to get there, but... When we do get to the end game, sometimes it's challenging. Heather, just on, on stunning, I think it, it's a really good point to, talk, to sort of lead into should Australian livestock have different rules to Australian livestock being processed in another country? And be interested to, to see, I mean, I, I get challenged at times about should all of the livestock that we export overseas be stunned? And often ask people what's their view on livestock in Australia being stunned? Should we have that rule introduced in Australia? And, I haven't seen RSPCA come out with a strong statement. Maybe I'm missing it about all it. livestock should be stunned in Australia. I just don't You've missed it. I've, I've so missed it. I just don't see it on. I see it around live export on your web page. I just don't see it around Australian mm -hmm. livestock. No, we, uh, the RSPCA's policy is very clearly: every animal should be unconscious and, and, and senseless to pain at the point of slaughter. Uh, and we don't see any reason why there should be exemptions for that. Um, and we're currently having conversations with state governments about. Um, the exemptions that they have applied for religious slaughter, we don't believe they're, from an animal welfare grounds, justified. I think also, also in the research that... Two seconds, yeah, just David's got a, got a no, comment. Fine. Yeah. Fine. Uh, you may or may not know that uh, pretty well every uh, sheep slaughter plant in New Zealand uh, slaughters halal, whether or not it's going for export. Um, we use uh, a reversible head-only electrical stunning and uh, the point there is that that meets the animal welfare requirement. It's done by a person of the book who happens to be Muslim but it could be equally Christian or Jewish person um, and uh, they appropriately face Mecca and every sheep is slaughtered halal. Now that came up because we export to uh, Muslim markets and uh, many years ago, another David, there are quite a few Davids around, um, David Blackmore showed that head-only electrical stunning was reversible, that it didn't kill the animals, that it was actually the knife cut that kills the animals. And these uh, Muslim uh, countries accepted this as a reasonable approach. And uh, so it's interesting when you tell uh, New Zealanders that every sheep slaughtered in New Zealand, apart from a few uh, on, uh, on farms and so on, are slaughtered halal, they sort of start getting a little bit twitchy um, because they don't really, uh, it's not kept a secret. The point is that you can't separate um, uh, animals that are slaughtered in New Zealand and consumed in New Zealand from those that are going to be exported. So both animal welfare and, uh, and uh, religious requirements have been met. 
Kelly, you were going to say something? I just noticed that in that um, small amount of research that we did with the, the um, people who were you know, balanced or opposed to the issue, the people who had very strong views expected different standards for animals overseas. And that's because they're more concerned. They don't trust overseas. They feel good about Australian avatars even though they're not sure what goes on there, but they have real deep concerns about our animals, something happening to them in another country. So I know Troy's sort of arguing for equality, but the point is they have a different standard in their mind about it. So you've got to start from the point in their mind that satisfies them. They had deep concerns. It was, it was somewhat frighteningly xenophobic that these people in other countries are barbaric and might do more damage to them. So they have higher, they have higher expectations. So Kelly, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't ask you the question because the, you know, the response would take all day. Uh, <laughs> what do we do about it? But I mean, it's a, is it about the story? What it's not about the story, but how industry tells its story. Yes. If you look at the live export situation in 2011, there was a period there where there was probably general agreement, right or wrong, that the industry wasn't getting its story across. The issue, the story about the issue is one, but the story about the industry generally was another. I mean, your thoughts? I mean, it, it looks like the public because, as I said, the, the situation your gut feel tells you, you, are, you know, when, when I'm being attacked, I should tell you all the good things we're doing. And it must be because you're missing the good things. And really the public are saying you need to deal with these bad things. Yeah. So it's that change in messaging that's needed and, of course, that other side which is starting to listen to the people who are raising these issues. And I guess what I'm saying is it's, it's not in the middle of a crisis. There's too much smoke, Ben. It's about... No, no, that's, yeah, that's pre that true. situation. You don't want. But you're much better off um, doing these things not in a crisis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don, to add to that, it's not about the story. It's about what you do. Um, if you if you can't deliver and show what you do on the ground is is actually meeting what you're saying or what you think you might like to say or what you think you might like to do, if you're not doing it or actually got processes in place to achieve it. It's all for naught, and it's all PR spin, and you just let, you just put another target on your back. It's all you know. You have to actually deliver, and and you have to actually show that you're delivering, not just say we're really great guys because we're feeding the world. I mean that just doesn't work. You have to do actually do it. You have to make sure animals are actually meeting um, SCAS. You have to make sure, and you have to talk about. What are you doing in the Middle East to ensure sheep are being stunned? Because they're still not being stunned. And that's nearly two million of them, and most Australians don't think that's acceptable. And they're the sorts, if you can address those things, the, the uh, opposition to your industry will really fade. Thanks, Heather. I'd like to get back to the audience for questions. Yes, George. Um, Mike coming this way, yeah. Uh, George Asap, the question for uh, someone who was talking about New Zealand. Uh, my understanding is the New Zealand High Court have overruled uh, a case where they allow stunning for chicken in New Zealand and it was taken to court by the Jewish lobby. And we were given the right to take animal for stunning from New Zealand <laughs> as well to certain country around the world, that they will not allow animal to be killed on their ground there without stunning. Uh, I don't believe that this is general in New Zealand. Until now, the countries in Israel, for instance, Saudi Arabia, and many other countries in the Middle East, they will not allow it for religious reason. Even OIE have accepted the fact that those countries have the right to kill their animal uh, their way. Now, if an organization in Australia like RSPCA is, uh, I believe, funded by the government, no. is calling, well, that's what I heard, I don't know. <laughs> no, we are not funded by the government, we're funded yeah. by the community. Just to be um, really clear on that. Fair enough. Someone was saying that early, sorry about this. Anyhow, I, I, I found it very, hard to believe that we're sitting here on something that even government uh, and court, high court, have done that, and we're still arguing about it. We'd love to see every animal standing everywhere we go, but 
uh, it means we have to ignore those markets. They considerable market. I mean, the Heather was saying two million. It's more than two million Heather. Last year, Saudi Arabia imported 11 and a half million sheep alone, live. And uh, this is more the, this is this where animal welfare is needed. I see it, you know, I mean, could you please someone answer this question? Thanks. I'd be happy to Thanks, George. Yes, David. have a go. Uh, certainly the OIE uh, decided to remain silent. I was on the ad hoc group for the um, slaughter for human consumption um, standards of the OIE. And the OIE decided, quite rightly, I think, to remain silent on the issue, provided advice on the best stunning methods and the best slaughter methods, and left it to uh, different countries to make up their own minds, uh, because it is truly international. Um, the uh, situation in New Zealand, of course, is we only export to markets that are happy to accept um, halal slaughtered animals that have been stunned in that way. Um, and uh, it is certainly true that um, the Jewish community uh, achieved a dispensation on uh, poultry uh, when um, the, uh, one of the amendments to the Act came through with regard to uh, religious slaughter in New Zealand. So it's always complicated. Um, the idea, um, in terms of our idea, is that we want to engage in dialogue um, as far as is possible um, and to uh, see if we can achieve both religious and animal welfare uh, issues uh, simultaneously. Further questions? In the, just in the Senate, yeah. Thank you. Perhaps more of a question for Andrew and Heather. Andrew, you mentioned about farrowing crates and how the science, you know, you, you're doing the research, but it hasn't actually delivered any uh, reasonable outcomes yet. Just wondering how that's playing out in terms of telling the story about what you're doing. So is, and again from Heather's perspective, is explaining that this is difficult, you're doing the research enough? I would say, from my perspective, this isn't, it's not an issue that I've seen in the media, but how's that playing out? And from taking Kelly's theory, perhaps from Heather's perspective, you know, how, do, how does it feel to be part of that conversation? So um, one of the things we find in focus groups with consumers is that they don't really have a high interest on average about where their meat comes from. And they don't particularly want to know but they are very clear that they want to be assured and secure in the knowledge that those who are responsible for getting it to their plates are doing the right thing. So the average person, that's what makes them a bit vulnerable to an activist who comes and puts in their face um, visuals and things that are, are very uh, depicting the, the very poorest of our industries and that has an impact. So. It's a, it's a very expensive thing to try and educate the public about the intricacies of what our industries do. Firstly, because they're not that interested. Secondly, because just in Australia, there's 23 million of them. It, it's almost impossible. So what we have tried to do is make that information available for those who actually want to see it. And this is the start of a transparency program for our industry. We're getting videos up on our website for those who care to take a look about what happens on a pig farm in an abattoir. We, have, uh, we are showing the process of putting an animal through an abattoir, missing only the sticking. Everything else stunning is in there. Now most people would not want to see that, but for those who want to have a look, it's there and it's brutally honest. Uh, most people won't, as Kelly pointed out, most people are not going to go and have a look at that. So that's why you don't see the argument about farrowing crates, but at the same time, a lot of activist groups are putting their version out there. We can't convince them of the benefits of farrowing crates. So, I mean, we do, for those interested parties, try and make the information available. That transparency path that we're on hopefully will move more and more in that direction, uh, live feeds out of pig farms. And, and the, the ultimate philosophy we have is that one day, we would love to be comfortable that anyone who chose to ever go onto a pig farm at any time could do that and not and be happy and proud of what they saw. 
course, I'm not sure we'll ever get quite there, but that's a philosophical position that drives what we're trying to achieve. So I suppose to build on, on that, I actually think the pig industry will get there and they're not far off and I'd actually be showing the video including, including the killing because the more you hide it, the more that meat, it says that, oh, it's a bit yucky, so I won't show you. If people want to eat meat, they should, you know, it's about understanding how, how it's raised and how it's killed. And what most people want to know is animals had a good life and they had a quick, fast death. And it was painless, as painless as possible. So I'd be encouraging them to actually show the whole picture. And, and likewise, you know, that's where you guys need to get to too. Um, but so the RSPCA has had, um, we haven't, we don't really say very much negative about the pig industry and haven't for a long time. As soon as they made an industry commitment to move away from sow stalls, um, we, we, they're, they're culturally the industry had taken an enormous step. They were recognising um, animal welfare. They were recognising that even though they saw production benefits in sow stalls, that the community wanted something different and they were going to find out a way to do that. Um, so we've been involved in, uh, we were on the, the, um, the bid committee to help uh, APL get funding for the, the CRC for pork, uh, whatever its full name was, the pork CRC. Uh, um, and we've been involved in and are on the research committee, so have got really good, um, very close hand uh, knowledge about what the research that the industry is doing on farrowing. We also have our own standards for the RSPCA approved farming scheme where, where we, you know, we recognise that the industry and, con and uh, conventional um, facilities in the industry are using farrowing crates, but there's some really interesting innovations coming from overseas. But for our own standards under the approved farming scheme, we don't allow them and we say to consumers, um, this is an area that needs work. We've still got some concerns, but we're really pleased the industry is investing in finding large-scale commercial solutions. So we can say all that because we know it's all about sharing information. Thank, uh, I'll take one more and then we're going to have to close. We're running out of time very quickly. Thank you. It's more a comment. Uh, Donna Bennett from the department. I'm also a veterinarian and a cattle producer. Um, most of you or some of you may have read the front page of The Land this week. Um, I'll just describe it. It was um, an abattoir with two carcasses, beef carcasses hanging down and two children behind a uh, window glass observing the process. And I think that's what we need to, to see more of in Australia, around the world. But it's, it's part of addressing the broader issue of the divide between regional Australia and, and the metropolitan areas and educating children and young adults about where food comes from and why it's so important and the value of it and I think the transparency in showing these processes is really, really important. And then it's their choice whether they eat it or not. But, you know, farms are great. You know, they're, they're a great experience and we all grew up or knew somebody when we were growing up, we went to a farm. But not many kids do that these days. So they make their own opinions through social media, media through awful photos to say, oh, that's, all, that's awful, that's, you know, that's a terrible, shocking thing. But I think the more that it can be a positive story and the process is shown, then that can only benefit the whole industry. Thank you. Thank you. Look, I'm going to have to... Got one burner, have I? Steve. Yeah. Can it, is there a mic just coming down the outside? Just one more ahead of you. Just, oh, John Edwards, just seeking some clarity, please. Heather, I've looked at the RSPCA, or one of the numerous RSPCA tags here on the, uh, in the internet, and it says the, uh, the national body is f f funded in part by the Australian government. Could we get some clarity around that, please? We received $30,000 from the federal government from the Department of Finance. And the RSPCA, so RSPCA nationally has an operating budget of about $100 million, of which 2% comes from governments collectively. I didn't, I didn't say we don't get any money from the, the, the government, governments. Um, it's certainly not the majority. 98% of, the, of our money comes from the community, be it fundraising, be it people adopting animals, be it um, purchasing. Uh, things in our stores or, um, or, or getting vet services. 
Okay, look, I'm going to draw it to a close there and uh, thank you for your participation, the audience, for your questions. Um, Troy, Kelly, David, Andrew, Heather, thank you very much for agreeing to be on the panel and accepting the questions. Would you please uh, give them a round of applause?